Welcome to Find the Way. Have you ever thought about labels, the labels we wear uh, from clothing, uh, maybe the label we drive, the car we drive, or the labels that we give to people like politicians or the labels that we put on other people or perhaps you know has been put on you. Labels like proud or stubborn, uh, naughty or haughty or slimy or that person was slick. There's some of the nicer negative ones. We don't often hear the positive ones, though, like trustworthy or that person was faithful or patient or hardworking. Hey, try those on for size. Today on Find the Way, we're going to tell the story of a woman who would have been known as a prostitute, unfaithful, a flirt, even desperate. She probably wore the label of shame, but all that changed when she had an encounter with the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And I'm delighted today as we talk about the labels that we wear to have our good friend, Dr. John Radford, here again in the studio. Welcome, John. Thank you, Mike. Um we're just glad that you're here. Uh, you talked last week on forgiveness, a little bit about your story with Nelson Mandela. And as we work through that, it's very easy to label people, isn't it? From a political realm, we label countries, what they're known for, but especially individuals. As I say the word label, what comes to mind? I mean, for me, labels are useful because if I can label something, like if I'm labeling a file, it's useful. Uh, so it, it helps to simplify our world of relationships to make them more simple. But in the process of labeling, we can go more than that. Um, and so I can begin to oversimplify and not capture or give a wrong label to something or a false label. That's a challenge. And do I take that on, Mike, or don't I? Um, if someone labels me, what do I do with that? Um, and what if you change? Like five or ten years ago, that certain thing happened. You got the label, but you've become a different person today. How do we move past that? We'll be right back with John to unpack this subject of labels. But first, let's listen to a song by Hillsong Worship called Cornerstone. Welcome back to Find the Way. I'm Mike Sherbino, your host here today. And uh, with us in the studio is uh, Dr. John Radford. John, thanks again for being here today. Last week, we talked about forgiveness. We're going to talk a little bit more about it today, but especially under the topic or under the banner of a label. I was going to say under the label of labels. <laughs> that would work. <laughs> Let, let's think about labels for a moment. Um, it's a real challenge, isn't it? How labels get put upon us and we don't know how to get rid of them. But sometimes there's a value in a label, isn't there? Sometimes there is, Mike, because 
if you label me as something, uh, then, uh, you know, if, John, you're being a bit weird now or you're proud or whatever, what some of those words you used, uh, maybe I need to just think about it for a second, uh, say, wonder why Mike's saying that or wonder why they're saying that. And the reason why I say that's important is because if I stop and think about it, th- there might be some truth in that table, or even if it's totally not who I am. I got one for you. Checking it. Yeah, go. Workaholic. Right. There okay. What are you going to do with that? Yeah. So if, workaholic, I've got to stop for a moment and say, John, am I a workaholic? Uh, yeah, there's a part of me that is. I am a workaholic, so I have to acknowledge that. But yet, no, that's not because I I can make choices about what I do in my work and I'm not totally addicted to it. So if you're not totally addicted to the label, um, how much does that label drive you, do you think? I th- And here's the key thing. I think it depends on how much I allow it to, right? So what happens particularly with difficult labels that don't, define who I am is if sometimes by focusing on them and over focusing on it in fact the way into the studio today I was listening to a program where they were talking about labels funny enough and and they were talking about how getting feedback uh, on on the internet right in terms of and these were people with some profile getting feedback on it and how they would go to the negative um, it's a natural thing to look at the negative way people are labeling us as who we are. And they were just talking about how they deal with that. But it's so true because if a, na- a label is negative to me, I will see out of 10 labels, one negative one will stand out against nine positives. That's the, that the research shows that. You know, it's very interesting. Uh, about three or four weeks ago, there was the uh, the Republican and then the Democratic convention. Mm. And as it's being spun out, we know the Republicans, they were bashing the uh, the leader for the, uh, the Democrats, uh, Hillary right. Clinton. Right. And yet uh, when... The Democratic convention got underway. Uh, there were people up there, you know, defending her and mm-hmm. trying to give a different uh, persona of who she is, including her own husband, who went to bat and said, this is not who my wife is. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you feel? How does somebody process the feelings? I've started to wonder, you know, the comments about Trump, the Trump, the comments about Clinton. Uh, how do those people at night when they're going to bed? What do they think about themselves? I, I, and this is where God's in this as well, right, uh, Mike? Because um, if you think about persona, persona is that part of me. So if I think about my core self, it's got two bits. The, the, there's the inner side of who I am. Then there's a part of me who, of who I'd like to be to you, who I'd like to be to my wife, who I'd like, I'd be, I'd like to be to my child, and so on, right? And that's the persona. It's how I would like to be experienced by those around me and the world around me as well. So in that sense, when there's a difference between who I think John is compared to the way I would like people to think John is, if I see there's a difference there, that causes tension for me. It causes an inner tension for me in that area, right? That dichotomy is, is difficult to, to hold together, isn't it? It is difficult. And and that's where, so just where we said, I said earlier, just stop for a moment and think, Is that me? That is important because maybe part of that tension between who I think I am and who people think I am is important just for a moment. But then to sleep, right? That's what you're asking me, John, how do I sleep at night? Um, To sleep at night, I've got to be clear about who I am. Um, and I think that's where God says you need to be clear about who you are in Christ, right? Who, Who am I in that sense? And that's the part of me that... Uh, I actually do need to give to God. Uh, and it comes back to reputation. It's part of this, who, who is this guy and who I'd like to be known for. So let's take a different twist. Mm. Last week, you talked about forgiveness in marriage. So let's assume the situation where someone has cheated. I think of some situations uh, where the husband cheated on the wife. They mm. decided to stay together. They're going to make it work. Mm. How does the hus- the wife in that situation deal with the label that she has in her mind of her husband who's been unfaithful. Right. How do you work through that so that there can be a redemptive portion in that relationship? Because if I'm always looking at the person as being the failure, the unfaithful one, the cheetah or whatever, yeah. they're never going to yeah. have a chance. And, and I see it so often in relationships, uh, marriage, but also you see it in business. You see it in community where something happens, trust is broken, and then I label the other person around that. Um, Mike, how do we deal with it? Part of it is if, if for that wife who's labeling her husband, if she doesn't change the label, 
there's a chance that it will continue in some form. And, and it's very hard to get out behind that label. Right? How do you change the label? What do you mean? So it's a choice. It's a choice to say, and that's part of a dialogue. That's part of a conversation that needs to happen between them, a real conversation about that. And it's part of forgiveness. So if I choose to forgive you for something, if she chooses to forgive him for that action, that deed, um, and they work it through, right? If, then, in fact, part of that choice to forgive is, in fact, to say, I'll remove the label. Um, when that label comes back in her head, she's got to stop and think. And if she uses it, obviously, then they can talk about it. But sometimes you don't have to use it uh, out there. You can just think about it, and you're already in that trap. So what do you do? Do you pray about it? Do you, is there something that you do? Do you sprinkle magic dust to uh, get rid of the socks? I wish there was a pixie dust, right? Get, yeah. No, I, I, think it is, I think it is prayer. I think it's saying um, you've actually got to give part of your hurt to God. Uh, that's what it is. So if, if, if I, so let's say I'm the one who's being labeled. Um, what do I do with that? There's a part of it that you can't just change people's perceptions of an art. I mean, because sometimes you don't have the opportunity. Sometimes people, if I think of the media today and the impact of social media, uh, I heard again a report this week of that young girl in Victoria who, who killed herself many years ago now. And right. a young person writing a song, I think, in, in Europe somewhere about that, right, uh, for her. But think about that situation where she actually took her life because of the labels that that children around her uh, who put us giving him. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And so part of it is then is to say, ask for help. It is. It's, it's, it's helped me. This is where I'm at. Um, and that's where people around you reach out uh, and say, is this me? Right. Um, and uh, we've had conversations around that, Mike. Is this me? Uh, how do I how do I how do I deal with this? Um, and there's the God part in it. It's saying, Lord, help me. Um, I need your help in this situation. You know, in a few moments, I'm going to give a, a talk uh, on this whole subject from when Jesus met the woman at the well, who was known as the local prostitute, an unfaithful person, and she had really been labeled. It was powerful because her encounter with Jesus, she realized that he saw her in a different light. Mm -hmm. How do we understand that for ourselves? When everybody puts a label on us that we know, hey, that's not who I am anymore. Yeah. How do we allow Jesus to intersect our lives to uh, at least create right out of the wrong uh, and it, it's it's almost again i say just stop for a moment because if i stop for a moment and say lord what is this really for me and end of the day i mean what the bible says is quite wonderful it says it, it doesn't matter to any really serious degree it we feel it but it really at the end of the day it doesn't matter what people think it's what god thinks so I need to go back to who is this guy? Who is this person? Um, Lord, what do you really think of me in this situation? And there, there's, a, there's a quote um, by Kelly Bryson. She wrote some years ago. She said, I'm never afraid of others' judgment. She said, I only having my own inner self-judgment triggered by their judgment. And that's a very interesting quote. And wow. I, and I, and that's where we've got to give it to God. Because if your label of me, Mike, triggers my own self-judgment, then in fact, that's a challenge for me um, to do it. And, and at some point, the only way to do that is say, Lord, help me. And it's as simple as that. Is that what you've, that's, it is. Is that what you've done? I actually say to myself, I say, Lord, you've got this. Um, because I, there's a point where uh, I don't know what to do in those situations. Uh, Lord, you've got this, um, because I know I can't got it. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me about the pathway to healing. You've, we've talked about forgiveness. We've talked about labels. Uh, I know there's not a one, two, three approach, but mm -hmm. is there at least a couple key things that help us to get on the path to healing as we recover from our shame, from our mm -hmm. past? Mm -hmm. I mean, part of it, Mike, is to forgive. So it goes back to what we spoke about last Forgive week. myself or others? Both. Uh, because by forgiving you, in fact, I'm also forgiving myself. So let's say I made a mistake. Let's say, um, uh, yeah, I, something's happened and I actually, I did do wrong. Uh, then, in fact, to face that 
And to that's forgiving myself. That's saying, and how do you forgive yourself? It's kind of hard, isn't it? Um, it is. And I think we need God to help us. Um, and I, even people who don't know God, when I talk with them, ultimately they're saying they are talking about God. Because that's a step of faith. It is a step of faith. Believing that God has forgiven and he sees me as clean. Yes. That's a that's a faith step, and 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 people take it. Uh, and if you, I'm just saying for those who are listening, if you don't know God and that step seems really strange, it's not complicated. It's just saying God help me. That's why I'm saying it is that simple. As simple as that. Yeah, it is. And for me to forgive you, that's where that's the tough part. Sometimes if I can't do that, I'm saying God help me in that because. I'm finding it so difficult. And I say again, not to jump over the problem or over the label, but in fact to deal with it and in dealing with it to act in grace. Well, as you begin today to think about the labels that you've worn in life, sometimes those labels have uh, sounded like the optimist, the pessimist, brainy or dumb, married, single, divorced, faithful or unfaithful, promiscuous or prude extrovert or interviewed, educated or non-educated. How have those labels shaped you and impacted your life choices? Some of you have lived up to them. Others, you have thrown them out. And some of us go through life getting bitter rather than getting better. And some see what has happened to us as a sentence rather than a gift. The labels seem oftentimes to haunt us. And oftentimes we live up to their reputation, but that doesn't have to be the case. I think of the disagreement between two Christian brothers. We find their story in the New Testament. It was Paul and Barnabas. It was over a young intern they were taking with them on a ministry whose name was John Mark. And you can read the story in Acts chapter 15. On a previous trip, Mark had deserted them and now Paul didn't want to take him, but Barnabas did. And the Apostle Paul, by his choice, hung a label over this young man's head, that of a failure or a quitter. But at the end of Paul's life, we find him writing in 2 Timothy 4, verse 11. We hear now the old man, Paul, saying, only Luke is with me. Will you now get Mark and bring him with you? Because he is helpful to me in my ministry. Mark had the sign of a deserter hung around his neck when he was a young man. But now it had changed to someone who was faithful. This morning, we come to a story out of the life of Jesus about a woman who had been labeled. The woman in our lesson becomes someone that we're drawn to because her journey is something we can all identify with. She had a story that was filled with innuendo. The fact that she'd had five husbands and was living with someone could speak volumes. It would be easy for our minds to rush ahead and cast a judgment. And we think, ah, oh, that's content for a good Harlequin romance. And we would want to throw stones. But before we throw stones, think about the label that we want to put on her and that maybe has been put on you. A little while ago, I saw uh, a spread in the Vancouver Sun. Uh, it talked about the challenges of M Monica Lewinsky, who made what someone referred to as a youthful error in the 90s. Somehow, the president of the United States got away with his unacceptable behavior, but Monica became cannon fodder for late night talk shows and faced incredible obstacles in getting work after her fling. When asked how she would best describe the last 16 years of her life, she said one word, shame. Shame was the label that she had hung around her neck that she felt others had put on her. Everybody has a story. You have a story today. And the story I want to talk to you about is found in John chapter 4. It's the story where Jesus met a woman at the well, a woman who had had five husbands who was living with someone uh, she came to draw water, not at the normal times when all her friends would have been there, but to avoid their scorn and ridicule, she came at high noon. You know, a lot of stories begin with once upon a time. Once upon a time is a code word for, let me take you back in time and explain what was happening where the story unfolds. And so let me do that today. The political side and the animosity was significant. The political landscape was a place where things were tense. And for Jesus to walk this way where he was could very well have been at the risk of his own life. For centuries, there was infighting. Imagine the hatred uh, that we saw years ago in Bosnia. Imagine the hatred that we now see in Syria. Imagine the enmity that we've seen in years gone past between Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland, or the feuding between street gangs in some of our larger cities. If you have some idea of the feelings and the causes between uh, 
people in those scenarios, you'll understand then the animosity between Jews and Samaritans in the time of Jesus. Both politics and religion were involved. Labels were hung around everybody's neck. And feelings of ill will were uh, probably went back before the separation of the northern and southern Jewish kingdoms. Even then, there was a lack of unity between the tribes of Jacob. Four centuries earlier, Alexander the Great had pitted the Jews against the Samaritans, and the ill will went deep, creating tensions between Jews and Samaritans. Alexander the Great had built a fortress in Samaria because he felt that the Jews could rise up against him. And then he had the Samaritans police the Jews. Is that so strange? We have one politician today uh, canvassing to build a wall between his country and another country. So even four centuries earlier before Jesus uh, walks into Samaria, tension was building. And for Jesus and his disciples to walk into Samaria, there was great tension and animosity. It's with those centuries of opposition and the incidents behind their people that we can understand the surprise of the Samaritan woman. When Jesus comes to her and we read in verse 9, he says, will you give me a drink? And the Samaritan woman said, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Because she knew the Jews didn't associate with the Samaritans. And then Jesus says these amazing words that began to lift the label that was around her neck. He said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus comes to Jacob's well and he meets this woman. This landmark is still significant today to historians. It's where Joseph was buried and it would have had meaning for some uh, just as the Vatican has for others today. It's a place where people know for certain that Jesus was there. Why is that important to us? Because it's at this historical marker that Jesus said, I'm going to remove the labels. I am the one who can change your reputation. He's the one who can change my reputation and yours today. The well became the place where the the woman could either be avoided or met. As I said earlier, if she had come early in the morning or late at night, she would have ran into people. But the fact that she comes at midday means she was trying to disassociate with anyone who would point a finger at ridicule for the reputation that she had. If you were looking to find a wife, well, you would go down to the well early in the morning or late at night. That's where the good girls would hang out. But if you went at midday, it means you were looking for someone that you could pay a few shekels to for a good time. And so she goes to the well to avoid confrontation and ridicule. But Jesus decides to meet her. And I want you to know today that regardless of what the label is around your head, whether it's shyster, whether you had an abortion, whether you're a prostitute, whether you're a drug addict, whether you're a swindler, whether you've been unfaithful, you put the label. Jesus wants to change the label. This lady comes to the well because obviously she's thirsty. Uh, Her reputation has dogged her throughout the life, but the reality is that she's physically thirsty and she's emotionally dry as well. And she comes to the well at midday because she needs water. And there she meets the Son of God, who in all his humanity is also both tired and thirsty. What would have been normal would have been for a Jew in this position, as Jesus was, to barter for the water and have her draw it. Instead, Jesus humbles himself and he asks her for a drink. The humility of Christ is seen here and it becomes a crack in the door for the woman to wonder, who really is this man? And as is the case anywhere, conversations start around mundane uh, earthly subjects such as water and husbands. And Jesus presses the woman to find out what exactly these things mean for her. Woven through the section are two challenges and questions that are posed by Jesus. He said, if you knew the gift of God. And then he said, if you knew the gift of God, he would have given you living water. You can be sure there's a lot of double meanings and implications here. Because the woman as a resident of the place called Shechem, she knows the location of every well. So when Jesus says that he could have given her living water, she's thinking, okay, tell me, especially around here, because I don't know what you're talking about. But living water, this refers to water that flowed in a spring or a river or a stream that is moving, not the kind of water that stood still or you would find in a well like they were in front of at that point. Living water was precious and valued, and according to rabbinic law, was the only water that could be used, get this, in their ritual washings to make pure those who were impure. You getting the picture? 
she's an impure person. And she's thinking, is there something that can wash away my reputation, can wash away my sin? Everyone knew the area of Shechem had no rivers or streams. Even Jacob had to dig a well to water his flock centuries before. How could a Jewish outsider who barely knew the terrain offer water that no one else had found? And maybe you're wondering how this Jewish outsider, this man Jesus, the Son of God, can offer living water for your situation to remove the, um, the label, the shingle that you're ha- hanging around your neck or that people have hung around your neck. Now, you know, when I think of the word survive, uh, I do not envision some beautiful scene here. Uh, Around the well of Shechem, there's not palm trees blowing in the wind with gentle sound of water lapping up in a sun-drenched beach. No, I sing a a single pine tree standing alone on a highway somewhere in northern Ontario. It's minus 20 degrees, the wind is blowing, there's driving snow and the wind is bending in the wind and the roots are holding on, but it looks like at any moment they will snap. I see in this story that kind of picture, someone trying to hold on. A single woman who'd had multiple relationships and trying to survive. A series of broken relationships. A series of nights of crying herself to sleep. Of children saying to their mother, will there ever, will we ever have a daddy? Will there ever be enough? And she wipes away the tears and bravely tries to answer. She says, one day soon, children. But enough of that. I need to go draw water. But that one day becomes this day. And this day can become your day. And Jesus knows that she's hiding behind a mask and he probes deeper because Jesus was on a mission. He was on a mission to meet that woman at the well. And Jesus is on a mission today to meet you at the well that you're trying to draw water from. And he wants to whisper in a way not to put you down, but to draw attention to the situation that there will never be enough from what you're trying to draw from until you draw from him. He's saying, I'm the one who gives living water. I'm the one who can help restore your future. And you see, our path to healing happens when we choose not to be trapped by our past. Many times our culture, our friends want to remind us of our mistakes. And Jesus says, I know about your mistakes, but I've come to give you life and to forgive you. And you see, our path to healing also begins when we choose to take responsibility for our choices. To say, Lord, you know, I know the mistakes I've made. And by your strength, I'm going to change. I'm going to press on. Today's going to be a new day, a day of new beginning. This woman discovered that her path to healing began when she stopped deflecting the issues, when she stopped pointing the blame. I like her, this woman. She squirms when she's caught. She wants to deflect the issue when Jesus says, go call your husband. But finally she answers, I really don't have a husband. And in the back of her mind, she's probably thinking, did I just hear what I thought I heard I say? Jesus said, you've answered correctly because you've had five husbands. You know, come on down, Elizabeth Taylor, who had eight. And uh, the one you now have is not your own. Whose husband was he the husband of? Sounds like that the guy she was shacked up with was likely just as thirsty as she was. I don't know the relationship you're in. I don't know your situation. But I want to encourage you to choose to be in relationship with Jesus. Because when she made that decision she began to discover and experience the living water that Jesus said only he could provide. There was a great preacher by D.L. Moody who once said, God sends no one away empty except those who are full of themselves. And I, I believe that as you're listening today to this broadcast, it's possible that you've come to a point where you say, I'm just empty of myself. Lord, you know my label. Will you come into my life today? and help me to change it so that I can follow you. Well, you've been listening to Find the Way. You can find us at findtheway.faith. We've been here today with Dr. John Radford, and thank you for being with us, John. And, And as we close, why don't you, in the quietness of the moment, wherever you are, in your car, in your home, simply say, Lord Jesus, I want you to help me to take control of my situation, to become the person you want me to be, and to put your label on me, that I'm your child, that I'm loved of you. Write to us at findtheway.faith. We'd love to hear from you. We look forward to that this coming week.